So for yeah. chess, for chess as an example, like uh, it may be that the human brain has been shaped by um, our history with hunting, right? Like we have, we, there are parts of our brains that just respond to hunting like situations because hunting is mm -hmm. such a deep part of our evolutionary past. And chess, in chess, in some sense, you are hunting. Yeah, the king. Yeah, exactly. So in that sense, that the real theme of chess might be hunting. That's really interesting. Can you give another example of a, a similar kind of meta theme of that sort? Because that's a great, that's really a great narrative right there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my, arguably my most popular game is called catch up. And in that game, you're trying to build the biggest structure. And it seems to me that building things is sort of like an er human motive. We just connect to the idea of building something in a very intuitive way. You know, um, another example is ordering things. So jigsaw mm -hmm. puzzles, like I think jigsaw puzzles play into this very basic instinct we have for trying to find or create order where there might, we might not initially see any, you know. Um, yeah, Absolutely. so jigsaw puzzles have a theme too, but it's a deep evolutionary theme. That's cool, I like that. So building and then there's ordering, there's hunting. Yeah, I love it. Those are, mm -hmm. those are great. <laughs> uh, any more nuggets like that you can throw? Um, I think Go actually has, has a deep theme, even if I can't quite identify it. Some, some people say that Go uh, reminds us of um, a sort of organic process. It's flourishing of life kind of a mm. thing. And that might be a, a reason that Go is so inspiring to so many people. I don't know if that's true, but um, it does certainly feel somewhat lifelike to me. Not like cells surrounding something, a cell surrounding another cell and taking it over, something like that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. That's interesting. Really, really interesting. For winning the MSO Game of the Year. Um, Thank you. That's awesome. For, for your game Circle of Life, which was one of the uh, the tournaments that we we held uh, in August 2020, and we're also we've also got a tournament this year uh, with Circle of Life. Actually, uh, so a huge congratulations. That's a big deal. But that that game has no luck in it, right? Uh, Zero so luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if so, I had my druthers and could play whatever I wanted in life, whenever I wanted, it would always be a game like that. Okay, so let's get into that. I'm not sure that everybody knows what an abstract game is. Uh, can you, yeah, maybe just yeah, explain what, what is an abstract game? Because people are familiar with lots of types of games. We've got backgammon, chess, and MSO. You know, we believe in uh, celebrating all forms of games. That includes games of luck, uh, games of you know, pure skill, all forms. But what does abstract mean? Yeah, so there's a little bit of ambiguity in this definition because people have different definitions. But I can tell you exactly what I'm interested in. I'm sort of an abstract game purist. So uh, I like, uh, when I taught, say abstract game for the purpose of this conversation, I will mean a game that lacks a theme. It's for two players. It has very short, elegant rules, has geometric gameplay. Uh, it has uh, emergent, deep gameplay, and it has no luck and no hidden information. Okay, just, just to unpack that, when you say emergent for people to understand, you, first, you mentioned simple rules. So you want a game that's simple, but you want it to be deep. So the idea is that some really deep things can emerge out of the game despite its simplicity. That's that's what you're talking about there, right? Right. Yeah. And so complex st strategy, complex tactics from elementary rules. Cool. That makes sense. And, and when you say no theme, obviously a lot of people are familiar with games. When we say themes, they're games that have like they could be. Agricola, which is about farming, or Catan, where you're selling land, and that's a thing. But you like, you like, you really love games that are just kind of clean in terms of their aesthetics, uh, yes. basically. Um, although one could just as easily, you know, slap on a theme if you wanted on an abstract game. You don't have to, right? It's true. For me, it's the geometry that's beautiful, and so um, frills and stuff get in way in the way of the geometry. So it hurts the thing that I most enjoy. Yeah. So I actually got into games around the time that I started grad school in my early 20s. Uh, so I, uh, like a lot of grad, grad students, not all, but some, I was really good at finding ways of not working on my dissertation. Uh, and so I had a friend who was also 
uh, often in the mood to avoid working on his dissertation. And we both liked games and we started playing them. And around that time, I discovered uh, Hex, invented by John Nash and independently by Piet Hein, although there is some debate about that. Uh, and uh, I just thought it was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. And it got me inspired to try designing my own games, and in particular games with like extreme amounts of parsimony and emergence like Hex has. So, so, so not, 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 everybody, not everybody knows what Hex is, but it's basically the simple game that uses hexagons and you're trying to kind of connect one side to the other using just one type of piece, basically. So, yeah. uh, so very, very simple, as you say, and yet complicated, but also beautiful in that, uh, you know, there's always a winner, despite it's like the way it's, it's really very well designed. Yeah. Um, so, okay, that's cool. So yeah, and Hex, very, very much of a, a modern abstract game. Uh, when we say modern abstract, obviously we refer to the fact that it's contemporary as opposed to the classic abstract games like Go. Um, but, okay, so sorry, so Hex, John Nash, and everybody knows obviously that John Nash uh, was uh, the guy who created the notion of a Nash equilibrium in game theory, won a Nobel Prize. Uh, there's a great movie, Beautiful Mind, about him, right? Uh, I think he plays Go in the movie, not Hex, but uh, yeah. another abstract game. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, I was... Uh... So I, so I started designing games and I got more and more into it. And I've designed hundreds and hundreds of abstract games, although a lot of them have been bad and just a few, I think, like really like achieve what I want to achieve with abstract games. Uh, but eventually I got so into game design that I, um, I ended up working in the board game industry professionally, uh, which is what I'm doing to this day. Designed hundreds now and yeah. only a few have worked. Can you tell how early can you tell if a game is going to work or not? Like, how does that work? How, what, what is the process? Well, it's different for different kinds of games. For abstract games in particular, you generally know right away. Like, uh, you know, I'll invent a game and I'll either know in my head that it's bad or I'll know the first time I play. And I'll also know whether there is any scope for changing it. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so because abstract games, or at least the ones I design, are, um, they're, they're, they're singular ideas, you know, uh, they're just about one thing. So if that one thing works, then it works. And if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. And there's not as much wiggle room as you might have in a game with lots more rules where you could kind of shape this rule over here or move that rule over there. Sure. Um, yeah, it's more inspiration and less perspiration for abstract games. Some of the, you know, the, the more contemporary abstract games, modern abstract games are uh, Corridor, for example. Um, mm -hmm. Great do, game. Do you like, you, yeah. I love Corridor. Corridor. Love Corridor. <laughs> Producers, because they also make Quarto, another yes. abstract game. Are you as big of a fan of Quarto or? I am not. It's a little more complicated. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, well, it's, it's maybe more complicated in rules, but I think actually the strategy is less complicated. Yes, that's right. It is a strategy for Corridor is so freaking complicated. Yeah, it's such that's a simple like. game, and yeah. I get blown away. Like, because I played it, I played it a bunch of times, and you know, I still, I still don't know what what the perfect strategy is. I don't even know, and I'm not even sure. Like, because I asked some of our top players, it's not even clear to me if it's an advantage to move first or not in corridor, which is yeah. Nuts. I've I've often wondered, like, at the highest level of play, it does it become a stalemate because neither player wants to. No way, no way. Someone's gonna win. I'm pretty sure. Well, okay. <laughs> interesting. Okay, we're going to philosophical. It, it could it could it be a thing where where well we shouldn't talk about this. I have a whole layer, bunch of theory about this. No, but that, that I know. I love I love I love that notion. I mean, I've never seen uh, a situation uh, like that that the that you know the top play of seen stalemates like actually care. So, but you're saying theoretically, I don't know. It's it's right. Really a, maybe, maybe if it were right. true, it maybe. would be at a level of play way above what anybody uh, plays at now. Maybe yeah. it's something where. You know, you don't want to put down your blocks because you realize you're wasting uh, an opportunity. To, it's like, you know, that there's a famous story of the, uh, the two samurai that are standing across from each other. Neither of them makes a move, right? Exactly, exactly. Just standing Same kind of dynamic. Waiting, because as soon as you make a move, you're creating a weakness for the other. You give away the game, exactly. That's right. So yeah, yeah. maybe that's the case with putting down those blocks in corridor and each move your pawns back and forth. I don't know. That's interesting. You're right. Uh, so, uh, and actually, I assume at some point, 
you know, they would probably have the, you know, the computational power if someone used the AI to probably crack it, I would assume. But uh, a lot of these games haven't been cracked because nobody's really directed that much AR, artificial intelligence research to, towards them, unlike chess or Go. Um, but um, which is really, it is really, really interesting, actually. Um, so corridor, super deep. But yeah, the quarto, you're not sure that it's quite as deep. Uh, and that's, that's a good point. What are, what are some of your other favorite, uh, you know, uh, modern abstract games? Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh, I can get me talking about this forever. So um, I, I might not know all of them, but please, please go. Ahead I'm going to exclude my own games from this conversation, because it's always a little bit icky when designers yeah. cite their own games as their favorites. Uh, so I'm going to say um, Slither is one. It's okay. played Ooh. with a Go board and Go stones. It's a connection game. Uh, sounds a little is, bit like, I, have, I don't know exactly what it is, but it sounds a little bit like Hex in a way. Yeah, it's inspired by Hex, okay. but I actually like it a lot more than Hex. Wow. I mean, it, cool. I mean, if I were going to pick one game that's my all-time favorite game, it would be that one, I think. Wow. Um, but one that's nipping at its heels is called Demeo, which is a, uh, a a droughts variant, basically. Hey, can you um, can you spell Demeo? D A M A. Uh, sorry, E O D A M E O. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I actually so like you know droughts checkers. I actually don't like those kinds of games in general which makes this really surprising to me, but this is so beautifully constructed. And the combination- oh, Dama, Dama, Dama is like how they say checkers in Russian or something. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the origin of the word. Christian mm. Freeling, who's sort of one of the most important abstract game designers made it. Mm. Um, so you'd have to ask him, but uh, it, uh, it creates these just like beautiful combinations, like checker style combinations across the board that like can they can really span the whole board and uh, lead to incredibly surprising results uh, that are just really, really fun. So DeMeo, I love a lot. Okay, cool. Um, one more is called AU, A-Y-U. Um, and that's a game where players, it is also played on a Go board with Go stones and the stones of each player, black and white, start kind of spread out over the court all over the board and uh the the players goals are to bring their stones together into a big clump basically um and uh cool. yeah yeah it's uh very beautiful well, i gotta test well. yeah i've never i haven't played those games. i need to learn them so much for me to learn mm -hmm. um, yeah there's a lot of these games it's really cool you know i i'm always trying to expose myself to to new games and and learn more so so just to be clear, first of all, because these are pretty much always two-player games, right? Because you don't want to have a situation where, where there might be some sort of king-making or, or diplomacy or politics, right? Uh, right. Okay, so always two-player. And, uh, and in terms of, uh, you know, we said no luck. So, for example, we have, because we've always struggled a little bit with, with that to some extent. I don't know if you're familiar with a game called Entropy. Um, which we I'm have familiar with it. I have I've played it once, I'm, so I don't know it very deeply. It's a beautiful game, and players take turns playing order and chaos, and you kind of sum up your points to see which which side does better uh, in these double rounds. But uh, it basically plays on palindromes of colors, and it is a very beautiful game. But you are pulling out marbles or tiles or whatever you want to call them out of a bag, uh, and and so chaos pulls it out, and uh, or was it was it order? I forget, one of them pulls it out and places it down and the other tries to mess things up. But the fact that it's, you know, there's some luck as to what you pull out, um, that means that it's not a game of, you know, of perfect information. So my question to you is, should that be count, should that count as an abstract, as an abstract game? Because we, we yeah, do count I don't it, know. We do I don't count know. it even though we feel like, you know, it's, it's one of those things that's totally on the border there. Yeah, I mean, some people, would say that the games that I like with their the strict definition should be called a combinatorial game so that abstract games can encompass a greater variety of things like the game you just mentioned. Maybe that's the way to do it. I don't know. Okay. Uh, so, okay. So you're totally into combinatorial games and yeah, abstract games. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, even, you know, chess is chess an abstract game. Again, not certainly not modern, it's old, but is it an abstract game? I mean, it has, it certainly has pieces with, with the theme of sort of, right? For me, it's an abstract game. 
Yeah. Because I mean, the theme is um, secondary. Incidental. It doesn't really. Yeah. No. It's you know, true. Yeah. Well, except for the king, I guess, in a sense, he's still there's this notion of a yeah. king of capturing. Right? Well, actually, there is a deeper discussion to get into here, which is that when I say no theme, I mean no explicit theme, but I actually believe all games, even the most austerely abstract games, have a theme in a certain sense. The good ones do. And what I mean by that is they, um, something about their way they're structured resonates with our pre-existing perceptual machinery in our eyes, in our, in our brains. Um, and that, that only happens if there's some connection between the structure of the game and the way our games, the way our minds have evolved to perceive things. So that's a deep, a deep kind of theme, um, uh, which all, which all games have, I think, but I have a, a difficult time putting it into words better than what I just said. Well, perhaps, perhaps, I mean, that, that makes sense, but certainly to some extent, obviously we need to resonate with something to enjoy it. And, and even a game that only has black and white pieces, you know, there's, they say like, which again, chess, obviously has, but has more, more themes in there, but just purely black and white. I mean, they, there's this idea that you still have the, you know, the ultimate struggle between good and evil, right? Perhaps, uh, right. <laughs> even in its most, you know, pure form, perhaps. I, anything can symbolize anything, right? Uh, uh, right. And when we, we, and we, as humans, we're so good at projecting things onto, uh, right? Anthropomorphizing or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, we interact with, um, so, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, so let's talk uh, a bit about, uh, about your game, Circle of Life. And obviously, yeah, Ketchup, that's cool. Um, I would love to hear more about some of the other games, but what, you know, what is it that made Circle of Life, yeah, uh, what brought it to life? How did you come up with it? And explain, can you explain to everybody what Circle of Life is? Because I think most people here that will be listening or watching this won't know what Circle of Life is. Yeah. Perhaps I should share my screen if uh, please go help? for it. Okay. You should, can, are you able to? Yes, I am. Awesome. Hold on. Here we go. Okay. So this is Circle of Life. This is a sort of picture I made for it. Circle of Life, even though this is a picture of a box, it does not exist as a commercial prod product and may never. Um, so okay, uh, this is a game where uh, no, no, just to be clear, people can play it on Board Game Arena. Uh, and so yeah. it does exist out there online and people can go ahead and play and enjoy it. Right. And Board Game Arena is where the MSO players played it during the last tournament. Yep. Okay, so this is a game that actually is modeled on life and more explicitly modeled on life than Go, which we were just talking about. So it's a strategy game where players evolve species to eat each other in a growing ecosystem. This is what the game looks like um, on the table. So this is the end of a game right here. So just to describe it for those people who are having a hard time seeing, you've got, it's a hexagon based game and you've got different shapes of different types of hexagonal patterns around it are your rules for the game. And basically uh, from what I understand, you're gonna put down kind of claim hexagons. And as you create different patterns amongst those, those hexagons, they can eat the other, uh, the other patterns. Is that right? That's right. So in the game, you're building small shapes um, consisting of between one and four connected hexagons. Yeah, so these in, a sense, in a sense, it's almost like, uh, you know, Tetris has uh, four different uh, shapes you can use, all of which are built are four blocks. Like that's, I think that's why it's called Tetris, right? It has Tetra in it. And then I heard that the is might be like reference to tennis. I don't know, but it's always four. But you, yours has, a, you've got, more than four, you've got, you, you know, up to four. And with hexagons, there's a lot of ways you can create four. Uh, yeah. You're not necessarily using all of them, but you also have one and two and three uh, pieces. That's right. So in, in Tetris, those shapes are called polyominoes. Here, because it's a hexagonal tessellation, they're called polyhexes. But um, the way you can think of them is each shape is a critter that belongs to a species that all share that shape. And each critter can eat uh, a critter from one other species. And the relationships, the eating relationships are shown in a circle around the board that shows which species eat which. So players take turns 
building these critters and then eating uh, enemy critters with the shapes they built. An enemy um, critter is something that touches, a critter that's touching you. Well, enemy is the enemy, that's a different color, but right. it's touching you, and at yours, and you have the right shape, you can eat it, basically. So. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And so you play until either one player has eaten 20 pieces of the other player, in which case that first player wins, or if a player can't place a stone, which means they've filled up their part of the ecosystem as much as um, they can, and then they win in that condition as well. So how did you come up with the rule set? I mean, this is the, you've got the entire rule set here in this image we can see, but how did, oh yeah, how did you, how did you come up with it? Because obviously yes. you, could, you could have, you could have, you could have changed the, you could have, you know, I don't know, created a lot of different permutations or changed the order of. Uh, yeah. Uh, of so I, uh, I used to work at a company called North Star Games. They have a series of games called the Evolution Games that represent elements of evolution in gameplay. And I was trying to think about how could I make a game that captures some of the dynamics of evolution in as minimal a way as possible. So that was the original inspiration for this. Um, and so I wanted to create um, an ecosystem uh, that had like diversity in it. And the way that it appears diversity is maintained in real ecosystems is through something called intransitive competition, which is a fancy phrase that means rock, paper, scissors relationships. So. In, in real transitive competition. Yeah. In real ecosystems, rock, paper, scissors relationships appear to be fundamental to the maintenance of biodiversity. So I said, I'm going to try to make a game where different shapes represent different species and they are related to one another through intransitive competition. And that way I would make a food chain that circles back around on itself, which is what makes it intransitive. And I would try to order the species according to how difficult they are to evolve. So what does that mean when you're building shapes on a board? It means, well, uh, different shapes have different degrees of freedom in the building of them. And if you can calculate the number of degrees of freedom in the building of the shapes, you can calculate how difficult they are to make. And so I built a path diagram that um, sort of captured all the degrees of freedom and then uh, through this path diagram, I could do a calculation to calculate the difficulty of making each of these species. And then um, this guy, this postdoctoral fellow at Harvard in computational biology actually helped confirm my calculations by doing simulations to see the actual frequencies with which these things get built um, in sort of random uh, critter building situations. Monte, um, Monte Carlo simulations of so sort. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah, so that's why I can't. That's how. That's why the species are ordered the way they are. They're not arbitrary. They're and, ordered. And you're you're pretty. You're, and so you're quite. You're quite confident that you've got the best order. Yes, I'm 100% confident I have the best order. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it works great, and it. It's. Uh, I think that's a key reason that the game works in high level play. Also. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what we're all about at, at the Mind Sports Olympiad. Um, but tell me, so. It's, it's really cool uh, and it's a beautiful game. I see, by the way, in the background, you've got another game, Bug. I just happen to see on another tab you've got open. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, actually, so Bug is like a spiritual successor of um, Circle of Life. So this one is a little more complicated to explain, but I'll, I'll do my best. So um, the reason I was interested in Circle of Life in the first place uh, is I think polyominoes or polyhexes are particularly easy for the human brain to comprehend, to remember, to manipulate in the mind. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is that in a polyhex, all of the pieces are contiguous, like this figure on the left here. Uh, so it's a, a, a pattern of contiguous color, whereas here we have a pattern of non-contiguous color. Like if you try to close your eyes and try to rotate this thing in your mind, most people will have a harder time than trying to rotate this thing in their mind. So continuous blocks are easier to, to play with. Right. So in order to create a deep game, you need to create game elements that the mind can perceive well. So I've been working on trying to create games where the patterns are contiguous and that's what led me to uh, polyhexes and polyominoes. So that actually is how I ended up at Circle of Life. But there is something about Circle of Life 
that I'm not sure about. Um, some people like it, some people don't, um, but it is, it is the fact that you have these fixed relationships that you kind of have to memorize over time, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. So I wondered if I could create a game where these where critters ate each other, but I didn't have to specify these relationships. And that's, uh, bug is sort of the answer to that, that thing. So in bug, what happens is, um, instead of eating creatures of another shape, each creature eats its own shape. So a creature's shape implies what it eats. Um, the difficulty with making a game like that though is uh, it, you could have, if you do, without changing the rules from say circle of life, you, you can get these infinitely recursive eating cycles that sort yep. of break the game. Uh, and so bug has one other thing, which is that after a creature eats another creature, it grows by one stone. Mm. Um, and there's a couple of other things to it. You need to know a couple of other things to play, but that's the basic idea. You eat and you grow and you eat and you grow until you run out of places to make uh, so, places so, so it's in, it is inevitable that somebody will win in bug. Yes, yes. And in circle of life, is it inevitable or not? It is inevitable, yeah. As well, circle of life yeah, as yeah. well. Yeah, I, you're almost just, so, all my, you just didn't like you just didn't like in circle life that you had all these rules. Basically, you tried to make it a bit more elegant, cleaner in terms of the setup of the rules. Yeah, in, well, it's ele more elegant in some ways and less elegant in others. In some ways, circle of life is easier to understand because there's a bunch of stuff that's more on the surface in circle mm -hmm. of life. That more yep. there are more like signs pointing you in the yep. direction of how to think. Whereas in this, this is. Um, this takes, I would say, a little more thought and experience to get at. Um, but the how many, how many times, how many times do you think you need one would need to play one of these games to kind of get a feel for it? Well, the nice thing about Bug is that you can play it on a very small board. So, uh, like this picture right here is a board of I think just uh, nineteen spaces, mm -hmm. um, and you can I you can actually start playing on there, and that makes it much much easier to, to mm. get at it. So when you do that, then it becomes as simple as circle of life to kind of comprehend it. That's cool. And circle of life, how long does it take you think to uh, to get a feel for circle of life? Oh, it depends on the person. Because that's, like, that's not that simple a game either to some extent, right? You... Yeah, so it seems like there's um, two kinds of people, two kinds of experiences that people have with the game. Some people uh, like get really like they just can't see into the game given all these relationships. Mm -hmm. And for them, it's not a good experience. Uh, but for another, for other people, it seems like not only fine, but like that's the reason they play is, is these, this, this sort of intransitive competition. So it's, you can't, there's no like one answer. Okay, gotcha. I mean, by the way, speaking of, of hexagons and, and modern abstract games, is Hive, would you consider that to be a, a, a a modern abstract game? We kind of do, we do yeah. include it, even though it has a theme that's not that important, but that there is a theme there, of course. Once again, it's secondary in a sense, right? Right, yeah, I, I definitely consider it an abstract game. Cool, and it is, it is a great game. And Hive, by the way, you can get draws. There are situations where you just have repetition. That does happen yeah. at the highest level of play. We've seen that quite, quite a lot, even though it's, it's rare. Like rare yeah. for normal players, but for the best players, it does happen. I treat draws with great caution because the draw frequency can change dramatically between inexperienced play, middle experienced play, and high level play. You know, uh, we like we're seeing with chess uh, at the oh, highest yes. levels of play, the draw rate is just bananas, and that happens it more is. and more. Like if a game has sufficient uh, number of draws in its game tree, so you have to be so careful about introducing draws to a game. You prefer games. Uh don't have draws, I assume. Obviously, if you do, you're, you, it's a low frequency, but would you rather have a game that it's impossible to have a draw? Like Hex, Hex cannot have a draw. Um, I don't have a definitive answer. I, if there are draws, I want them to be like infrequent, surprising events. Like, oh, that was cool. Wow, can't believe that happened, you know? Rather than, oh, there's another one of those. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That, that makes a lot of sense. That's cool, awesome. Um, so. Yeah. So, what is uh, what's what's on the horizon? Uh, what, what are you working on uh, now? What's, what what can we expect in the future? 
So uh, at the moment, I'm not designing abstract games at all because uh, with the birth of my son and with the sort of and with the work that I'm doing now professionally, there's very little time for anything else. So um, yeah, I have a uh, I have some stuff on the back burner. So I mentioned that um, arguably my most popular game is a game called Ketchup. I had an idea for creating a sort of descendant game from that that looks pretty promising, but I may not get to it for three years. Maybe, maybe it's time to catch up. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, there, there, there's, there's, that, there's that bad joke. I think it's told in, in uh, I think Uma Thurman's uh, character tells it in, uh, in Pulp Fiction, something like, uh, you know, Mama tomatoes crossing the road and two or two baby tomatoes. Oh, yeah. what, did, what did she say? Pulp Fiction. Yeah. Catch up. Yeah, pulp, that's right. <laughs> that's right. A little but, I got uh, behind. Um, so, okay, that's cool. Um, yeah. What uh, What about playing online? How has that changed? You know, the, your experience as a know, game player and designer. I mean, what is is Catch Up available online? What would you know? What? Yeah. Yeah. So Catch Up, you can play in two different ways. There's an iOS app. For it. Um, and then there's a site where people play abstract games called Little Golem. Yeah. L I T T L E G O L E M. There's a lot of good catch up players there. Um, cool. You can also play the aforementioned Damio, Damn it, Damio, I can never say it right, and Slither. So that's a Little Golem is an amazing site for abstract games. So is that, is that, is that your go to kind of like online? Uh game play thing when you have the time to just go and play online? Um, no, actually. Um, I don't get much time to play even online, but when I have lately, it's been Board Game Arena. Yeah. Um, both Circle of Life and another game, uh, which is my probably my personal favorite of my games, is also on Board Game Arena. It's called Blooms. And so uh, on the like, rare occasion when I have time to play, I, uh, I play on Board Game Arena. By the way, to, uh, just to get into, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is a bit too detailed, but are those games available for free for people on board? Because some games you have to have a premium subscription, some they're free. don't, they're free. So anyone can just go and just play them and try them out, which is awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, board Game Arena has been really wonderful. Um, so the one, one of the greatest difficulties of designing abstract games is that the goal is to make them emergent, mm -hmm. to give them lots of strategies and tax tactics that only emerge after through experience and repetition. But because of that, without actually being a master player at uh, the game you're designing, there's always uncertainty about whether a game will break or in some way become lame at really high skill levels. Um, and so Board Game Arena, because there are so many players on it, have given me sort of f f insights into that more quickly, way more quickly than I would have otherwise been able to obtain them. Oh, that is so cool. By the way, do you want to maybe stop sharing screen for a sec so I can yeah. be back with you? Uh, but uh, yeah, that's that's amazing. Uh, you know that you get so much play testing and so much feedback, and um, and there's such a great community. I mean, it is it is a, a great age, I think, in a sense for for game designers such as yourself. Uh, by the way, just kind of curious, random. I see because uh, uh, you you know I know aesthetics, geometry is very important to you. I see if you've got a, a simple ring tattoo on your finger. Is that your like wedding ring or what is yep. that exactly? Yeah, I don't like physical rings, so I, I got a tattoo of a ring. That's really cool. And yeah. uh, so it, it, looked, it almost was like two rings in a sense though, but it's one ring. Yeah, just, you know, a little extra style. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. Very cool. I like it. It looks, it's, a, it's a, it's cool. And did your wife, uh, has she got a, has she reciprocated or does she have a physical ring? She has a physical ring. She faints at needles, so she would never be caught dead inside of a tattoo <laughs> parlor. <laughs> Fair enough. I actually uh, have a bit of a needle phobia myself, though I don't know how I would deal with a tattoo. Maybe I'd be all right. I don't know. Uh, I've been doing a lot of, you know, temporary tattoos with my my daughter. Oh, and cool. My three-year-old daughter, but uh, but not not a real tattoo yet. Um, super cool, dude. So uh, I think people should totally go out and try Circle of Life. They should also try Blooms, both of which are free on Board Game Arena, and, uh, and obviously they can try any other of your games out there that are available and. Uh, uh, and do you want to give a plug? Uh, uh, you, obviously, you have your website there that was on. What, what was the domain again? Yeah, it's nickbentley.games. 
Um, and there's a link there that for just my four best games. And I think those are the things that people, there's a lot of games on there, but there's four, I think that stand out above the rest. Uh, they are Bloom's Circle of Life, Bug and Ketchup. Uh, and they're listed there. So check those out. Don't need to check anything else on the site out. I also post about my business uh, uh, in games as well. Awesome. Cool. Hey, I want to thank you for your time. And uh, um, yeah, I think, uh, oh, I, I don't think I'm, I didn't mention if I mentioned this, but you know, we at the Mindsports, in addition to having the circle of life as a game, we also had, uh, we also host the abstract, the modern abstract world championship. So, and, and that's where you have your best overall score from five different games. So Circle of Life was one of those games and we had Corridor, you know, wow. in there and Quartz. When did that happen? There. Well, th that was part of the normal Mind Sports Olympiad. So in August. Oh, oh, that's the one that I saw in August. Yeah. So okay, got it. every time we have our normal series of tournaments, people can come and compete at any single tournament. But if they want to win a meta tournament, which is where you're trying to like, get the best five scores over something, they have to you know, try and do that within whatever, whatever that is. So we have the Euro Games World Championship, the Modern Abstract Games World Championship, several, several kind of quirky world championships, including the Pentamine World Championship, which uh, yeah, so there, there, we have some some really great uh, great world championships, and it was cool to see that your game was part of that, and people loved uh, loved its edition, and we're looking forward to preaching it uh, in the future. And uh, yeah, yeah, I also want to say I was it was so fun to watch the games because some players showed up who are like instantly really good at uh, Circle of Life. Uh, this one guy named David Pierce. If you're out there, David Pierce, I was very impressed with how well you played. Um, and that, that was really fun to watch. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, David's one of our uh, Pentamine world champions. So he's one of the sense. overall greatest gamers out there and, and also real expert at, at modern abstract games and he can play anything. But yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's fun to throw for us. Like every time we put a new game out there for you know, our hardcore champions who are trying to master all these different games, it's like another obstacle course for them to climb through yeah. and, and master. And, you know, and, uh, and it's great. Your game has real depth. It's, it's quite a cool obstacle course. I think awesome. Thank you. It, it, that makes me so happy to hear. Thank you.